This program was produced by the Aotearoa Media Collective for RNZ and TVNZ, made with the support of Te Mangai Paho and the New Zealand On Air Public Interest Journalism Fund. Ikarorafti is going to be the most contested seat, I believe, of the Māori seats at the minute. What do I want from our next MP? Wow. <laughs> what did I get from the last MP? Nothing. Ka reo mātou whakaaro i te pakurite. So we're not all on the same wavelength when it comes to, to politics. This is the seat to watch. No mai ki te tai rāwhiti. Behind me is the northern border of the Ikaro Rāwhiti electorate that's shaping up to be the biggest battle in the Māori seats. Ikaro Rāwhiti covers more than 600 k's and we're going to travel from the north here in Farikahika all the way to Te Whanganui Ātara to find out what the communities of Ikaro Rāwhiti need from their next MP. Voters here will be deciding between two leading candidates. Matuara ki te kōrero nui o te wā, ara. Veteran MP Mika Whaiteri, who unexpectedly defected to the party Māori in May. The decision to cross the floor is not an easy one, but it's the right one. And former CEO of East Coast Rugby, Kushla Tangaire Manuel, who's been selected as Labour's new candidate. I want badly to be the representative for Ikaroa Rāwhiti. We'll talk more about Mika Whaiteri and Kushla Tangaire Manual later. First, we're starting our roadie in one of Ikaro Rāwhiti's most remote settlements, a place called Matakawa, where the East Cape meets the East Coast. This is Farikahika, otherwise known as Hicks Bay. And we're here to meet one of this community's staunchest advocates, who's prepping for the local Matariki celebrations. How would you describe the wairua of Ikoro Rafati? Yeah, our saying, always battered, never beaten, is um, quite an apt one for um, Ikoro Rafati. Innovative, you know, when nobody comes to your rescue, you, you learn how to innovate. You know, you can't stay in a place like this unless you deeply, deeply love it for lots of reasons. And there's a lot to love about Farikahika, but it's also facing some major challenges. From the end of the 1800s, the clearing of native forests made way for farming and the establishment of townships. By the 1960s, more land was cleared for pine forests, an industry that ramped up after Cyclone Bola in 1988. But people here have had enough. When people say the forestry industry here has lost its social license, what do they mean? When the East Coast Forestry Project first came through as a touted solution for Cyclone Bola, uh, they had made huge promises around the fact that it will create employment, uh, you can have passive income on your land, it will hold the rivers in place, it'll stop the land from slipping away. And after just one of those rotations, you can see that the impacts are indefensible. You know, they'll say, well, it puts food on the table, but it's taken all of our kai that we would normally put on the table out of our awa, out of our coastlines. All of that kai is no longer on the table. And so, yeah, it's become indefensible now, seeing the impacts upon housing, the impacts upon lives, the amount of lives lost, not just through the damage, but even those working in the pine industry. And that's what I believe we mean when we say it's lost its social licence. Tina says climate change is not a new problem here, but it's made worse by forestry slash, and there's been little investment to help this community prepare. Can you give me an example? What would it look like? You know, it's, it's really not uh, 
unfamiliar experience for us, for the roads to be closed, for us to be without power, for us to be without internet, uh, boosting funding for things like helicopter services for communities like ours, um, supporting local infrastructure here as well, making first aid education free and accessible to rural isolated communities so that we have a boosted level of first aid literacy at a population level in communities like ours so that people are not as dependent upon emergency services that can't get to your community. There's a saying here that people used to drive on the left of the road, now they drive on what's left of the road. 40 k's down crumbling Highway 35, we hit the tiny town of Tikitiki in the Waiapu Valley. This is Ngāti Puro Heartland. It's also the home of Labour candidate Kushla Tangaire Manuel. And the locals are flying their colours. You've got your red shirt on. <laughs> yeah. Is there a lot of support for Kushla Tangaire Manuel here? I think we need her. I think, um, you know, during the times we've been through Gabriel, I think she's a blessing. I mean, to have her actually on our doorstep and understand what it's like to be trapped and cut off and no power, I think she's going to be a great candidate. She's probably got a big job, but she's got a, a ton of support. Um, we'll, we'll be there to support her. Wayapu RSA is also the post office, the takeaways and the dairy. And its patrons are straight shooters. What do you want from your next MP? What do I want from our next MP? Wow. <laughs> what did I get from the last MP? Nothing. <laughs> but I guess for our next MP, and I won't name names, but if she gets in, first and foremost, um, for me, it's homegrown, um, lives at home, um, educated from the ground. Fifty-five k's on, we reach Tokumaru Bay. It might look like a one-horse town now, but it was once a thriving economic centre. Tokumaru had its own bank, a freezing works, and a bustling port. But those days are long gone. Places like Tokomaru and Tapuya Springs were set up as native townships. In the late 1800s, the Crown took the land from Māori owners and put it into perpetual leases with an ongoing right of renewal. The person with the lease was then able to just roll it over, roll it over, roll it over. It was never to come back to us. More than a century on, landowners like siblings Quintin Fakataka and Tracy Takarua remain locked out of their whenua. Well, back in the day, leases are only, I think they were for 21 years but with the right of renewal, which, you know, straight away alienated people of the land from their lands. What sort of rental are you getting for the leases? It's minimal. They, they used to call it peppercorn. Peppercorn leases. Mm. To add salt to the wound, the local sports club, which is built on a Māori burial site, has just had its lease renewed by the local council. When leases do decide to end their tenancy, the owners have to buy back their land at market value. It's usually out of their reach, and so the leases are unsold. Well, you know, it's heartbreaking watching other people do things to our whenua and while our own whānau and, and people of the community go without or live humbly, there's just no growth because we can't access our whenua to, to build on that. You know, everyone asks, boy, you know, we want to come home. Is there anywhere we can build? I say, we've got everywhere to build, but we are not allowed to build. So that's the sad thing, having people who are away from home, who want to come home, who can't. As we roll into Turanga Nui Akiwa, we tune in to the local iwi radio station, Turanga FM. Breakfast host Martha Smith and Rahia Timu Timu keep the mood upbeat.
かわこてチコテレテレ<笑>こうこれだってふわおてテレテレで<笑>カプタテレテレマリ<笑>ああいやはい。To be a kanohi kite on the ground.、Um, certainly, my whanaunga mika whaitiri was that during the pandemic and also during Cyclone Gabriel. But it's at those other times when we're kind of forgotten about, you know? All of a sudden they come home during big crisis and then it's like, oh, kahia, kahia tera.、Um, so I think for me, it's kanohi kite and also、um, working with our local iwi. Feeling forgotten about is a recurring theme in this electorate. 35k south of Wairua, we visit Raupunga, a tiny settlement facing some big issues. What are the challenges living in little rural Māori communities like this?、Oh, well, access to things people take for granted, like water,、yeah. um, reliable electricity. You know, it's nothing,、uh, nothing for us to have four to five days,、uh, a couple of times a year with no power. It's kind of like. Raupunga has had to be self reliant, even building its own water system drawn from a local creek. They're worried about the impact the government's water regulations will have on them. But their immediate concern is what Cyclone Gabriel has done to their water supply. It's just brought so much slash and silt down. I mean, I remember back in 2017 when we started building、um, our system, it was a beautiful, pristine creek. And now it's just a big mess. It's just full of debris, I mean, metres high, full of slash and debris. What does this community need from government to ensure that you have these resources forever?、Um, Well, we need to get back to basics. They need to come in here and clean their mess up because we didn't create the mess in our waterways. It was never created. Our, our tipuna never farmed like that. They always looked after the water because it was、um, a precious resource. Seven months on, the impact of Cyclone Gabriel is still plain to see. As we enter Esk Valley, the devastation is confronting. On February the 14th, Ikaroa Rafati was hit by one of the biggest storms in the history of Aotearoa. Four people are confirmed dead. A child located in Eskdale this afternoon, thought to have been caught in rising water yesterday. Eleven people lost their lives and thousands more were left displaced. Ricky Reed Davis was lucky to survive. Spending six hours clinging to this tree while the floodwaters raged around him. I can still hear it when I close my eyes. Just the, every, if you've been to Hooker Falls, it sounded like that, but with cars crashing and debris, everything hitting that house. There used to be another shed here somewhere that was just getting pummeled with stuff, big hay bales. Could hear the sheep going past me and Someone screaming that went quiet, luckily, because it was hard to hear the screaming as well. Did you think you were going to die? Oh, yeah. I think I went through the stages of grief. I got angry, I got sad, I started crying, I started swearing at the river. I did, did pick up the water and promise this valley. I said to the Esk River, if you save me, I'll come back and help with the cleanup. So, yeah, I did think I was going to die for a good three hours. Thankfully, Ricky's prayers were answered. He was rescued the following morning by some locals with a jet boat. His miraculous survival earning him a new nickname 
the Esk Valley Tanifa. You kept your promise to the river. I did. I have kept it and two days after getting off the tree I was back out here and picked up a shovel and started way up the valley cleaning one house and we've slowly worked all the way down with all the volunteers from from all over the country and I've been all over Hawke's Bay actually since. Ricky is one of many who've rolled up their sleeves to help others in the aftermath of Cyclone Gabriel. <laughs> Grassroots organisations like One Voice have swung into action. We've been putting support out there to our people to provide kai, uh, petrol vouchers, temporary fencing because of the looting that was happening here and all that sort of stuff. And now we're at that stage where we're providing a lot of mental health and up to 500 boxes of kai out to all 13 hubs a week. One Voice was originally set up as a support group for sexual abuse survivors, but founder Lindsay Abbott says it's had to pivot to help struggling whānau. How are people coping here? They are very confused, they're broken, they're lost in the system, they're lost in the unknown. They're stuck in caravans, they're stuck in cabins, and they are still living in a mound of salt that is there and around them all day, every day. And for many of our whānau, they've lost loved ones, they've lost their livelihoods, they've lost everything. And sadly, there are suicides that are happening because people are that broken. In terms of the addictions and the meth and things like that, are those issues getting worse? I think it'll be doubled or even tripled. I've had uh, a lot of phone calls from um, our people and uh, desperately seeking help for domestic violence and also uh, helping their loved ones with addictions and alcohol. Alcohol has become a friend to a lot of people also um, because they're really locked into that grief of the traumas of what's happened here with the cyclone. Yeah. As we leave this battle-scarred landscape, it's clear there's a long way to go before life here returns to normal. We've now reached the halfway point of our Ikaro Rafati Rodi, and we're in the heart of Mika Whaitiri country. The former Labour MP shocked her party when she quit without warning, saying she didn't feel hurt. Now standing for Te Party Māori, we wanted to find out how her constituents are feeling. So we hit the streets of Hastings. I support her fully because, um, am I allowed to say this? She's my family. <laughs> <laughs> so you're definitely voting for the whanaunga? Yes. <laughs> What are the most important issues for this community? Um, at the moment, uh, we've had the cyclone. Our people need something for their hiningaro. Uh, there's a lot of issues going on with infanos and I mental think health. Mental health. Yeah. We need help in that area. What do rangatahi or taiohi need here? Um, more jobs, I think, or more opportunity and exposure to experience in order for them to get a new job. Who might you vote for this year based on how things are going? Um, Te Pāti Māori, definitely. I think they're cool. Like, I think they're really cool. I follow them on TikTok. I think the great thing about them is that they're very modernised. They've integrated their um, kaupapa into the modern world. Who would you like to vote for? Oh, it was Labour. Labour? You're a Labour guy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yes, Is that yes. how it works in your family? <laughs> oh, I don't, what, yeah. I don't really follow the politics in there, to be honest. Do you know who the candidates are in this Ikarora race? No. Are no. you a Māori party or a Labour party guy? Probably Or National Act or Greens, obviously. Yeah, all green, yeah, yeah. You like the Greens? Yeah. You like the Greens? What do you like about the Greens? I like the Green. <laughs> no, sorry, oh, the Green. <laughs> <laughs> We're nearly 600 k south of where we began our roadie, heading towards the mighty Wairarapa. A phrase we keep hearing throughout this trip is kanohikitia, 
Voters want their MP to be visible in their community. But how on earth can you achieve that in an electorate this vast? We're on our way to ask someone who has some insights. You know, you're always going to get whipped in a Māori seat for not being there because your seat is so huge. I might be in Wainuamata one day, but something's happening up in Gizzi that, at the same time, and all they see is you're not there. You know, it doesn't matter where you are, you're just not there. So it is very difficult to get your face across the Ikaroa Te electorate, and it's one direction. It's not like a small concentrated electorate where you can drive around in one day. <laughs> you are driving 14 hours. Do you think the size of the electorate is a symbol of inequality? Yeah, absolutely it's an inequality. It's been an inequality since the day that they were established as seats for our people. In the 2020 election, Ikaro Rafati had the second lowest voter turnout of the seven Māori electorates. Just 67% of enrolled voters turned up to the polls. Marama believes it has a lot to do with a sense of disconnection. So they don't see the impact of government, central government decision making and legislation on their lives, although it does, until they're hurting. And when they're hurting, they'll rise up and they'll change governments because they've had enough. I do believe though there's, on the other hand, there is this apathy of our people that they can't make a change, so why bother? because 200 years has shown us doesn't matter who's sitting in the top seat, our lives are still here, still at the bottom of health statistics, of housing statistics. So I think voter turnout has something to do with that. But I do notice that every time the government changes from the red to the blue and the other colours of hues, um, it's because something's going wrong. They've had enough. Tell me, what are your thoughts around the strengths of the two candidates? Um, it's a two-horse race. Uh, we've got Kushla, who's well known on the coast for rugby and some things and knows the people. Mecca is more widely known because she's held the seat longer. She's been around for a long time. She's been up and down the coast. So based on knowledge alone, I think the strengths that both of them show is how to, well, Kushla knows how to manage an audience, probably better than Mecca, but Mecca, knows the political game, and she knows how to play the long game, and she's done it for a long time. But Ikaro Rafti is up for the grabs now. We've travelled nearly 700 k's, and we're on the last leg, heading over the snowy Remutaka Ranges to our final destination, Wainui Omata in Lower Hutt, the southern boundary of Ikaro Rafti. What is it that makes Wainui or Mata great? For me, it's my home. Like, I've never left Wainui or never lived anywhere else but here. Tiana Wepu is a first time voter this election. She's 21 and works as a kaiafina at Atiawa Nui Tonu Kohanga Reo. Yeah, I just enjoy looking after kids and it helps me a lot. Like, it makes me happy. It makes me happy, so every day I get to wake up and hang out with kids, it's really cool. <laughs> what are the challenges? Um, the wages and the funding, but also like the wait lists. We have a long wait list with our, for our babies especially. A lot of parents want to bring them in, but the wait list is just too long. Oh, not enough kohanga for all the babies that want to learn? No, not really. <laughs> Tiana loves her mahi, but it's not easy to get by. Is it a livable wage? No, <laughs> I don't think so. Like, I'm young and I shouldn't have bills to pay in that, but, you know, it's bug all. Like, I still gotta eat, I still gotta have a roof over my head, and just cost of living, like, everything has gone up for no reason, and it's hard. Kaha o tumanako o wawata mo What are your hopes and dreams? Um, so for my family to be healthy, um, that's important. Um, I didn't realise that was going to be so hard. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> my family are my inspiration, really. So 
for them to be healthy and to live a long life. And also, I just hope our kids don't struggle when they grow up. Hope these kids don't struggle when they grow up. It's the one thing, because, you know, struggling. I'm struggling now, and I haven't even hit my 30s or anything. So, yeah. The struggle here is real. 80% of Ikaro Rafati's constituents earn less than $50,000 a year. It's a sobering statistic as we reach the end of our hikoi. So what have we learned along the way? The people of Ikaro Rafati might not be rich, but they are generous and they're deeply committed to their communities. They are humble and they are hopeful. And what they really want from their next politician is a fair chance at a good life. What I want from an MP is somebody who knows and can support what it's like to live in rural isolation, who realises that that is an injustice, that that's a situation of inequity, and to do everything that they can to make sure that we get equitable access to everything. I want them to stand up and do what's right in all kaupapa, but on this one, you know, enough is enough and help us to get our whenua back. You know, undo the wrongs of the past and let us, as the owners and the shareholders, rebuild our community for our whānau and for our generations to come. Surely there's enough examples around New Zealand and the world of places that flood that we have a better civil defence plan. It can be done better and you're better off asking locals from the area than sitting in your office and asking a consultant about what we should do somewhere that that person's never been. We need you to be our voice. We need you to stand strong and behind our people and around our people. We need help. Our people need help. And you can give us and gift us the help. Fight for our people. For more Mata content, check out our podcast at rnz.co.nz forward slash Mata. For more Mata content, head over to onenews.co.nz forward slash Mata and TVNZ Plus.